Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Well, I received the good news that things were down here this morning. Thank God they were down every place. <laughs> That's the way some preachers feel about it. I was preaching down in Akron today, and of course their program is live on television. I think that maybe discourages people from coming if there's bad weather or something. And their auditorium is rather large, better than three times the size of our auditorium. And uh, you could have shot a 12-gauge there and missed everybody, I think. But uh, I tried to preach just the same as I would have if it had been full. And we had a good time, and it was good to be back in my home church. Things aren't always the same the way we'd like them, but that's where my roots are, and that's where I was saved, and I always thank God for my home church. I wish perhaps some things would change, and maybe they will, but I do thank the Lord for the opportunity to be there. And... Uh, to know that things were going well here this morning is a joy, too. I just feel wonderful tonight. I feel so strong, I believe I could crush a grape if I tried hard enough. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I'd, I'd rather be here than any place. I mean that. I've been in a lot of churches. I preach in a lot of churches, and there are a lot of, church, a lot of great churches in America, a lot of great people. But... Uh, if you're part of the family here, this is where you ought to want to be. This is where I want to be. I'm, I'm called away some. I don't always have to go, but I, I enjoy expanding our ministry and being in other places and having an influence on other people, but there just isn't any place like home. There isn't any place like our own church, and I mean that sincerely. The music tonight has just thrilled my heart. Boy, that was a great song. Um, I want Jesus more than anything. Now, he knows your heart. You can sing it tonight, and I can say it tonight. But he knows your heart. But I'm going to say it tonight, just like the choir sang it. I want Jesus more than anything. And I believe if you have him, and you should be satisfied, no matter what condition you're in. I think oftentimes uh, of um, uh, dear Sophie Wojnarowski, I've been to see her so many times at home, in the hospital, the nursing home. And uh, for almost seven years, be seven years next month, I remember the very day that they came out of the operating room. I was there with the family, and they said, uh, she's had a stroke, and it looks very serious, very difficult. And then the following days when they <clears throat> realized she had lost her speech, and uh, part of her was paralyzed, and she was in great pain. They never did alleviate the pain from that day until... Saturday evening when she died in her husband's arms, about 5.30, Saturday afternoon. Uh, Pops told me she just leaned over on his shoulder and that's all. Didn't even gasp or take a deep breath and just went to sleep in Jesus. And, uh, but all during those years, those seven years, of course, uh, she was not anything she wasn't when she was well. It didn't take a tragedy, as we look on it, to make her what she was. She was already that before she got sick. I'm talking about a soul winner. She was a great witness, probably one of the most outstanding soul winners, personal witnesses that I've ever known any place, anywhere in my life. And after all of this came upon her, you'd think, well, she'd be discouraged, downtrodden, give up. But she had a way of witnessing all the time. She would wait for somebody to come who could talk for her. She could say enough. She, she never lost her ability to say Jesus or saved. When the doctor was there, the nurse, when someone was visiting and a family member was there uh, in the nursing home, in the other room, she'd, oftentimes I'd go up there, she'd want to take me over to another room and go over there, save, save, talk to her. She was saying, come on, preacher, talk to her. That's what she would tell her about Jesus. That's what she was really trying to say. Talk to him about Jesus. Jesus was everything to her. And he's more than everything now, I'm sure. And I thank God. I tell you, Wednesday morning, we're going to have a celebration. Wednesday morning, 11 o'clock. If you can come, you come. Because it'll be a wonderful time to say goodbye or good night. I'll see you later. But I tell you, I just rejoice the last few days. It was my earnest prayer that God would allow her to come home. And he did. And we praise the Lord. And the family feels the same way. 
Now, in your Bibles tonight, I want to speak on the subject of lifting the weight of worry. Lifting the weight of worry. I don't suppose that there is any one of us that has been spared from worry, no matter how young we are. Sometimes we have a difficulty defining the word. It's a, it's a strange thing. We, we think we know what we're saying sometimes, and we mean to express ourselves well, but when people listen to us, they either misinterpret what we're saying or their understanding of the English vocabulary is different than ours. But worry is really, in the, in the real sense of the word, a bad thing to do. I, I, I guess I kind of want to say it's a sin. Uh, certainly there have been men in the past, great men in the past, great men of God in the past, who have defined it as so. I think the Bible would indicate that it is. It, it's not listed as a sin with the Ten Commandments or some of the other sins of the flesh, but it certainly indicated there that it's wrong to worry. Because to, to worry is to have unbelief. It's to fail to trust God. It's a failure to turn things over to Him. That's a weakness of the flesh. Don't misunderstand me. We all have it. It's a common problem. And some of the results of that problem are devastating. First of all, it creates emotional problems. I don't think there's a, a medical doctor, a psychologist, or a counselor that deals with people in any great degree that wouldn't confess to you, though they cannot all the time spell it out exactly, would say that people that worry a lot, stressful people, have a lot of physical problems, emotional problems, they probably would not have if they didn't worry. I know that's an easy thing to say, well, just don't worry. But uh, it's quite another thing not to worry. So one of the problems you're going to have if you're a, a worrier, if that, is a, if that is a problem that plagues you, is you're going to have emotional problems that are going to upset other parts of your being. I think that worry not only creates emotional problems, but I think it creates physical problems. Uh, certainly our, our emotions are connected with our physical being. People can literally get physically sick over worry. They can worry so much. They'll lose sleep. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll not be able to perform their duties as they should. They'll not eat properly or eat too much or too little or the wrong things. They'll worry, create physical problems. I think worry will also create spiritual problems. And that's, uh, of course, some people, not unsaved people, unchristian people, or un, uh, unbiblical people oftentimes would laugh at the Bible in a sense and say, well, or spiritual things, but... They have a spiritual part to them whether they want to admit it or not. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference whether you confess the truth or believe the truth. The truth is still the truth. There are people who don't believe man has a soul. We know man has a soul. We maybe can't draw an outline or explain it in words that are, are, are acceptable to everybody, but we know there's an inner psyche, there's an inner man, there's an inner person that is just as real, more real than the, the flesh and blood. You see the things I can touch. And uh, this spiritual person inside you that, it, that will ever be unfulfilled without Christ. An unsaved person can never have their spiritual desires filled without Christ. But uh, this spiritual person gets upset when we worry. It creates spiritual problems for us. It causes doubts. Doubts are a terrible thing. People doubt their salvation. You know, here God has saved you. If you're saved today, God has saved you. He's given you everlasting life. You shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about your salvation at all. I don't worry about going to heaven. I don't worry about going to hell. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I don't worry about when the Lord comes. I'm excited for Him to come. I would like for Him to come tonight. I pray that He will come soon, but I'm not worried about His coming because I'm prepared to meet Him. I'm not worried about if I'm going to be saved five years from now, because no matter what I do between now and the next five years, I'll still be saved. God saved me one time forever. He gave me eternal life, doesn't take things back. I will live forever with Him. So I know that, so I don't have to worry about that. But, but if, you, if you worry about things to the degree that you begin to doubt, and cast doubts in you, I've counseled with many people who have doubts about their salvation. Because they because they are 
worried so much about things, they begin to doubt their spiritual condition, begin to doubt God's Word. And that's a serious thing. It keeps you from the Word. Worrying people do not really, I, I say it, maybe it's just my phrase, but really get their nose in the book. If you're a worry wart, you don't do, you're the, really the one that needs to read the We all need to read the Bible. Don't misunderstand me. You don't need to read it any more than I do. But I'm just saying that, that if you're going to overcome that problem that plagues you, that's part of overcoming it is getting into the book. But contrary to that, worrying will keep you from opening the book because it makes you doubt God's Word so you don't see the benefit of reading God's Word and staying into it. Beyond that, I think there's another problem that worry creates, and that's selfishness. Did you know, really, uh, when you worry about things, there are selfish motives behind it. You're worrying about you. You're not thinking about others. People that, that dwell on their own problems continually are very selfish people. They have no time for others. They don't really have time to help other people or counsel other people or try to lift someone else's burdens because their own burdens are so great that they don't have time for anybody else. Jesus made a statement one time. He said, physician, heal thyself. Suppose that you needed an operation, and it was a very serious operation, and it was very important that you had it within a certain period of time. And you were very much concerned about it, and you checked around, looked around, and there was a very noted physician who performed that particular operation with great accuracy. And he had never had any fatalities from it, even though it was a serious operation. And I'm sure you would like to go to that physician. But at the same time, that physician had come upon bad times himself. Uh, some kind of accident or some kind of disease that had plagued him, and he himself was in the need of a physician now. He was sick or overcome with something. He was in the hospital bed. There's no way he can help you. He, he may desire to. He may want to, but he can't. Because there are problems that are plaguing him. And if you are concerned continually about your own problems and your own needs and, and, and your own, uh, and your own uh, uh, weaknesses, then you have no time, really, to help someone else or to encourage someone else. On the other hand, I say to you that if you would get in the business of being an encourager and you get in the business of being a helper, you'd forget about a lot of those problems. That's part of what the, the cure is. So thinking about those things. Now, to be concerned, and I'm not playing a word game with you tonight. I know sometimes we do that, so I want to be very careful you understand me. I say worry is one thing. I say concern is another. We should not be unconcerned. We should be unworried. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I'm going to make it a word. We should be unworried, but we should not be unconcerned. Concern is entirely different than worry. Different in this respect. Concern will cause you to pray, and concern will cause you to act. In other words, I, I, we oftentimes use this word in place of the other, and I don't think it's good. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we don't use the right vocabulary ourselves. That's why when God wrote this Bible, he used all the right words. There are no wrong words in the Bible. Sometimes when I want to express myself, I say the wrong word, and somebody misunderstands me. For instance, I think I just said this morning, I was preaching, I was using an illustration about you know, when, when our young people go someplace, and I meet them out here early in the morning, they get on the big bus, and they're going out of town for a day or two, and I say, man, I worry about those kids when they're gone. I, I didn't really mean that. Don't misunderstand me, because I didn't, but I, because I'm concerned about them, I pray about them. I don't, I don't sit around wringing my hands, thinking about the worst thing that can happen. There's going to be a bus accident, and young people are going to be killed, and I don't mean that. I'm not, I'm not worried in that sense. I'm concerned, and so I pray. I pray, I pray often about it because I'm much concerned about it. And uh, knowing not necessarily the, the one who's driving our bus or the condition of our bus or the condition of the roads, but knowing that the crazy people that are on the road, the drug addicts and the drunks and everything else. So I'm concerned about it, so I'll pray and ask God to watch over them. So I believe that, I believe that concern will cause you to pray and concern will cause you to act. Worry won't do that. Worry will, worry will just make you fret, will get you upset and out of sync with everything and cause you problems. So I want to give you tonight from Philippians chapter 4, God's prescription. God's prescription for worry. I'll begin reading at verse 6. Be careful for nothing, 
be careful for nothing. Now, now what that simply means is don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made, uh, be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound, Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There, there are six things in this. If you, if you know anything about pharmaceuticals, if you have an illness or you have a pain or you have a virus or something, you can go and there are different kinds of drugs off the time that a doctor prescribes. And there are certain ingredients that go into that that prescription that is supposed to cure that illness that you have or, or correct it or take care of it. So this is God's, as it were, we'll go to God's pharmacy and we'll get a pill tonight that has all the right ingredients, not one. I know you, if you leave one of the ingredients out, you're, you're liable to miss the most important one. But we'll get a prescription tonight from God's pharmacy that will give you a cure that will lift the weight of worry off your shoulders. Now, I'm sure you'd like to have that, wouldn't you, tonight? There are people here tonight that have loved ones in the Persian Gulf. I want you to be concerned. I hope we're concerned about them. We're facing some very troublous times, perhaps now a land where only God knows what's going to happen. There could be many casualties, perhaps even one among our own. But worry will not resolve anything. Don't be worried about it. Don't fret about it. Be concerned about it, because being concerned will help you do what some of our people are doing here. First of all, we have a prayer meeting. Every Sunday night before the evening service, every Wednesday night before the evening service, on Saturday afternoon, people are meeting here and praying about our men and women in the service over in the Persian Gulf. Now, that's concern. That's not worry. That's concern. Concern causes you to pray. Concern causes you to act. How can they act? We write letters. We send tapes. We try to encourage them. So we're doing the two things that concern will cause you to do. Pray and act. Worry will not do anything. So here's the prescription. Get a hold of it. I don't care tonight whether your worries are financial or, or have to do with your health or have to do with your family. Whatever the situation is, this is God's prescription. It's the panacea. That's the cure-all for everything that there is that has to do with worry. Number one, prayer. <clears throat> Verse 6 prayer. Be careful for nothing. Paul's saying basically, don't worry about anything. How can I do that, Paul? Well, first thing you need to do, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Prayer. Just simply prayer. Now, I know I, I don't put a time limit on prayer. Don't misunderstand me, but if you have more worry, then it seems to me like you ought to have more prayer. If worry is plaguing you, I'm not saying to you that I pray more than you do or that I, that I don't need to pray as much as you do or I'm not measuring you by me or me by you or anything like that or giving you those timetables. You know how much time you have. But I'm just saying if, if you sit around and worry for an hour, then instead pray for an hour. You say, but if I'd pray for an hour, I'd still worry for another hour. Well, then pray for two hours. Say, it wouldn't, matter. it wouldn't matter if I prayed for two hours. I'd still sit around and worry. Well, then pray for another hour. How long does it take you to pray to get rid of your worry? Don't take the time to worry. Take the time to pray. I find if I'm doing something that I ought to be doing, it helps me to keep from doing something that I ought not to be doing. So if I shouldn't be worrying and instead I'd be praying, while I'm praying, I won't be worrying. If I quit praying, I'll start worrying. Well, that's why... The Bible says men ought always to pray. 
and not to think. You can develop, you can learn how to pray all the time. You do not have to, well, first thing, you have to understand what prayer is and, and how you do it. You do not have to be on your knees to pray. You do not have to be in church to pray. You do not have to pray out loud to pray. You do not have to move your lips to pray. You do not have to bow your head to pray. You do not have to close your eyes to pray. You do not have to fold your hands to pray. None of those things have anything to do with prayer. Now, there are instances in the Bible where people knelt to pray. Jesus knelt to pray. There are instances in the Bible where people prostrated themselves on the ground to pray. There's nothing wrong with that. There are places in the Bible where they stood to pray. There are places in the Bible where they prayed out loud, where they prayed to themselves, where they prayed secretly, where they prayed openly, where they, all kinds of things. What I'm saying, when God says pray always, you can pray always. You can pray while you're asleep. I don't know, I, Brother uh, Folger mentioned as he preached to us last Sunday night <clears throat> that psychologists say we dream. Some people say, I never dream. I've said that myself, but I know I do. I don't know how often or how long the dream is. He mentioned some things that uh, psychologists and other people say about dreaming. I suppose our mind is active all the time, even when we're, when we're asleep. We say that the subliminal is active or awake all the time. So we're thinking things. So we can pray while we're asleep. You know the best way to go to sleep, some people go to sleep with a radio on. Now that's not bad, and have some nice soft music on or something you want to listen to and, and go to sleep with that. If, if you need something, you can't just lay down the quiet and go to sleep. Uh, have something on. I think the thing that you're listening to uh, will help, uh, you know, relax you and so on. But what better way to go to sleep than just lay in bed? Some of you have the idea, oh, I've got to get down on my knees by my bedside and travail in prayer for hours. There's nothing wrong with that. I certainly wouldn't criticize you if you do that. I, I, I'd, I'd like to get off my subject for a minute and just say something. You know, preach. one thing a preacher do once in a while is just, just uh, hit all those things that he doesn't like. You know, you don't have the advantage of doing it. Maybe if you write some of them down, maybe I have the same ones and I'd do it for you. I'd be happy to do it, share it with you. But some things that just kind of just irk you. There are all kinds of religious teachers and preachers and pastors and evangelists and radio and television and, and tapes and everything else that are out for people to have today. And I, I know people listen to them. I, there's no sense of me saying, well, don't, don't ever listen to a radio program, television program. Of course, there's a lot of good things on there. But it just seems like some people grab a hold of something and, and they, they, find, they find a guru. Now, a guru, what a guru is to me, I use that word, maybe I ought to explain myself when I say that. What a guru is to me is somebody that follows somebody no matter what they say. They, they never really check it out. The guy is smart, he's suave, he's a good speaker, he's uh, dynamic, he has a large following, uh, he has a big television, radio minister, whatever, and boy, pe pe some people just line up there and pretty soon they're reading his material and they're listening to him on radio or television and they, everything he says is gospel. I mean, he tells them, like I mentioned, he tells them not to borrow money, they don't borrow any money. They tell them to have a, a big family, and they have a big family. I want to tell you, somebody, it is nobody's business how big a family I have. That's between me and God and my wife. And honey, you're not going to have any more, whether you want it or not. You just get straight. <laughs> That's nobody's business but mine and God. And yet there's guys there, there's some character out here, he, he's not even married, telling every woman to have a dozen kids. Good night, don't get me on that for crying out loud. How in the world did I ever get off base on it? But that just aggravates me. Somebody always wanted to tell you what to do and how to do it, what you can do and what you can't do. Now give me the Bible. Don't give me your ideas, your thoughts, or your interpretation. Just give me the Bible. How many women in the Bible? I said, I said to a fellow one day, I said, how many women in the Bible had 12 kids? Name them. Right? Give me this big long list. I said, well, how about Jacob? Yeah, I said, he had two concubines, too, and two wives. Don't tell me. You know what? You can't pick a man. Let me tell you, and this guy's a man. He's a single man that's doing it. A single man. And he's telling him to have, tell me, I said, if the men had the babies, be one to a family if there's that many. Bunch of lily-livered cards that can't take an ounce of pain, most of them. Don't even know what it is to go through travail of childbirth. And here he is out telling everybody, that they ought to have a dozen kids or something. Repopulate the world. Now look, I don't care. If somebody wants to follow somebody like that, 
That's all right. That's your business. If you believe you ought to, if you believe you shouldn't borrow any money, don't borrow any money. I don't have any problem with that. I think you'd have a problem being a member of our church because we, unless God rains down about a million too, buddy, we're going to be in debt before long. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if you want to follow that, that's fine. I think that's a great thing. That's all right. And if you want to have a couple dozen kids, well, you know, the church will grow. That's all, you know, I'm not going to complain about that. But don't try to make somebody else think that they're no good or they're out of the will of God or they're low down or so on and so on and so on. I'm not, when I, when I preach to you, I'm going to try to tell you what God says. If you think I'm telling you the truth, you do it. If you think I'm off base, don't do it. I don't have any problem with that. I have a problem with these guys that are gurus is what I have a problem with. They, they want to give somebody advice, want to give it to the whole world, and everybody else is wrong, and they're the only ones that are right. This is the only book that's right. This is the only book that's right. Boy, how in the world am I ever going to get back to my message? Where am I? I'm still praying. I need to pray now. Let's pause for prayer. <laughs> pray. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Man, quit worrying. Take, take your needs, take your time, and go to God. You, I get back to my thought. You can pray anytime, any place, anywhere. You can be in a constant attitude of prayer. That's what you can do. That's what the Lord would be pleased with. A constant attitude of prayer. Pray is the first ingredient. We should pray for everything. How many of you do that? We, I, I don't know. I confess my sin. I don't do that. I'm sorry I should. But I get, I get in the habit like everybody else saying, well, I can do this, I can do this, I'll talk to about that, but everything and everything and everything. Isn't that what it says? In everything and everything. In everything. Prayer and the prayer is to be given with thanksgiving. Now, you know what that means? That's where faith comes in. When I ask God for something, I thank him for it before I ever get it. That's what it means. When you pray with thanksgiving, you're saying, Dear Lord, I want this, I need this, you know I need it. And God Almighty is going to give it to me, and so I believe him and I thank him before he ever gives it to me. Prayer. Ingredient number one. Two, look at verse seven. Peace. Everybody talks about peace. I, I think it's, if it weren't so tragic, it would be humorous. I mean, we're going to run this place. Not anybody gets out of line, we'll take care of you. We all talk peace and we all build for war. Everybody does. Smallest country, feeblest people, they still have an army. They're trying to buy one of the biggest commodities on the market today. You know, it's a tragedy. Even Mr. Reagan said yesterday, he kind of halfway apologized for saying, we, we, uh, we sold half the stuff that Iraq has got that we're bombing out now. Said, said that himself the other day. We made a mistake. He said, we didn't, we didn't understand what we were getting into. And here we are now bombing everything out we sold. Them. And it's because Iran was our enemy and they were fighting Iran, was, Iraq was fighting Iran. And so we, we said, well, we'll get, here, we'll get over here and help Iraq. So we kept selling them all kinds of planes and tanks and and all kinds of weaponry and everything else, and Germany was doing it, and, and, and uh, France was doing it, everything else. Now France and England, all of us over there bombing them out. Kind of silly. Everybody says, peace, 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 and everybody builds for war. Now peace, however, isn't just the cessation of war. You can be at war and still have peace. Now, that sounds kind of funny, but you can. I mean, the kind of peace the Bible is talking about. There are many people who don't really want peace. We refuse to accept what God offers us. We say we want it, but we don't really want it. It's one thing to say something, another thing to really want it. We, we say we want peace, but when God offers it to us, we really don't want it. We may want success, or pleasure, or vindication, or change, but seldom do we want peace. Peace may mean accepting God's will in the present. The way things are right now. And I'm not willing to do that. I, want to, I, don't, I don't want to live in the present. I want something better than what I've got. I don't like things the way they are. Even though this is God's will for me, I can't accept that. That's, if that's the way you have peace with God, is to accept things the way they are, then I can't do that. Well, then I'm 
then I'm laying out the terms for peace. I, I thought, isn't it strange that Saddam Hussein would come along and say, we'll withdraw from Kuwait if you do thus and thus and thus and thus and thus? I mean, what kind of a surrender is that? He's talking like he's the victor and we've got to meet all his, all his demands. Unconditional is what surrender is. Unconditional. You don't lay out the conditions. The conquered lays out the condition. And we come to God, people come to God. You want the peace of God? You want to get saved? They say, yeah. Well, here's the way you get saved. You trust Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to get saved that way. I want to get baptized, confirmed, go to church, do good, follow the golden rule, keep the Ten Commandments. I'm going to get saved that way. Never have peace with God. Here you are the sinner. Here God is the holy, righteous God. And he says, you want peace? Here's the way to get it. You say, I want peace. But I want on your terms. Now, we'll never have, we'll never be saved from worry. We'll never overcome the problem. If we don't put the ingredient of peace in here, we must accept it on God's term. We, we reject his peace for its depth of mystery. The Bible says the peace of God passes all understanding. And that's what many people, unless they can understand something or figure it out, you know, get out there. They won't accept it. I just accept God's peace. I have peace with God just because I accept it. I, I didn't, but he, said, he said, if I trust Jesus, uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I just accept that. Just believe that. Just trust Him for that. We would rather have an experience that we could explain or control, something we can do. See? I want to have peace. Tell me how to have it. Just trust Jesus. Oh, no, no, I've got to have peace. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. So I've got to have an experience. I, something I've got to do. of worry. Pure thoughts. Pure thoughts. You know, worry is a condition of the mind. Now, you've got to be careful. There, there's, a, there's a lot of religions and false cults out there that are talking about mind control today. It, you, you need to be careful that religiously, religiously, you can give your mind to Satan. It can sound religious. I mean, there, there's a lot of... The New Age movement doesn't just... They don't identify themselves. Every one of these groups or gurus that belongs to the New Age movement, they don't just come out and advertise that way and say, hey, we're part of the New Age movement. They, they, they have titles. They have all different titles and names and cute phrases that sound good. How, how, to, how to suppress this and control this and overcome that. And it all has to do with mind control, transcendental meditation, even yoga. Even though it's an exercise, it has a lot to do with the mind. You've got to be careful when you get involved in things that say, You've got to do this with your mind and control your mind. God suggests rather themes for thought. You want to control your mind? Here's a way to control it. Truth, honesty, justice, purity, loveliness, goodness, virtue, praise. Think about those things all the time. Oh, well, I do, preacher, because I watch a lot of television. That's all that's on television. Truth, honesty, justice, Purity, loveliness, goodness, virtue, and praise. Why, well, that's all they have on the radio and television. I've never, I've never heard anything but that. No, the truth of the matter is, is we're taking in so many things that are contrary to this. You know, it, it's, it, you say, well, it just goes in one ear out in the other, but it doesn't do that to you. It, it affects the mind. Whatever you, whatever you take in through the ear gate and the eye gate, affects the mind and, and uh, gets your mind out of balance see? and uh, causes worry. How do, how do you take care? How can you do anything about your mind? You're going to tell us now, you got some way to control your mind? Sure. Holy Spirit. Something wrong with that? The Holy Spirit ought to control your mind. Blessed Holy Spirit of God. We certainly don't talk enough about Him. I was speaking to someone that we must do a series of messages on the Holy Spirit. We've let those who have uh, ransacked that blessed doctrine and just gone to seed with it and, and just uh, practically destroyed it and, and mocked it almost. We've allowed them to, to, for, to make us curtail it so much that we, we don't even talk about them sometimes. We, we, say, oh my, we say, Holy Spirit, nobody's going to think we're Pentecostal. Say, Holy Ghost, and everybody, oh, we've joined the radical crowd. And we've allowed 
We have allowed false teachers to rob us of a beautiful, wonderful, truthful doctrine, part of the Trinity, part of God, the, the Holy Spirit, our guide, our protector, our, our teacher. It's almost as if we ignore him. Is he here tonight? Is he among us? Blessed Holy Spirit, can we grieve him tonight? Suppose now you folks that are married, well, you don't even have to be married if you live in a family, if you're part of a family. But let's just take a husband and wife. Suppose tonight that you have an argument sometime this week. So you decide that... Uh, I can't talk and I can't communicate and, and uh, we've just fight about this, so I'm just going to, I'm going to ignore my husband. He lives here and I live with him, but I'm not, I'm not going to bother to speak to him when he comes home. I'm not going to bother to say goodbye to him when he leaves. I'm not going to even acknowledge that he's here. I'll perform my wifely duties and I'll cook the meals and I'll make the beds, I'll clean the house, I'll do the washing and so on, but I'm just going to ignore his presence here whatsoever. Now, of course, we're human beings. We might react to that with great anger. I, I would assume that our, our first reaction is because we're not as tender as we ought to be if, if that one that we love so much and we live with and want to be with, they, they ignore us, you see. But we've become angry with them and just, just get the, make the fight all the deeper, you see. But the blessed Holy Spirit, God has typified His Holy Spirit by the symbol of a dove. And a dove is one of the few animals that has no protection for itself. It's one of the most helpless of all the animals. The lamb is another one. The, the, uh, the, the, the Christian talks about the little lamb. But here's the dove. No, no protection whatsoever from the, the birds of prey, from those that would kill it or destroy it. Uh, it's beautiful. The white dove, beautiful dove, soft, cooing, tender, sweet dove. And, and is a symbol of the Holy Spirit when he came down upon the Lord Jesus and rested upon him. It means to me today, not like God the Father, who in his justice and anger uh, can, can put forth a judgment, but the blessed Holy Spirit, who is grieved when we ignore him who is grieved when he who lives inside our bodies, who has taken up his abode within us, and we ignore his presence, and we force him to participate in things which are wrong and ungodly and irresponsible, and we grieve him. We need to, we need to realize his presence and ask him to help us to think in our minds, to think about good things. Beautiful thing. You know, it's too bad. It's so much easier to talk about bad things as good things, isn't it? I don't know why. I, I, just human nature, is it? Is it the, the devilishness in us that we take some kind of glee when we find out something bad about somebody? We are so quick to grab a hold of it as the truth and to spread it as we should spread the gospel. But uh, when we hear good things... It's like we keep them to ourselves. It's because our mind is so filled with bad things. We see so many bad things, hear so many bad things, our mind fills so many bad things that we don't want to talk about good things. Wouldn't it be wonderful, though, if we could just sit around and talk about good things? If our mind was dwelling upon those things, I believe we would at least more than we do. And so the blessed Holy Spirit, through the author of the Word of God, he inspired him to write this, says to us, you want to not worry about anything, you need to be in prayer, uh, you need to be praising God, you need to be thinking pure thoughts. You need to have peace in your heart. Fourth thing is, <clears throat> in, the, in God's uh, remedy, in God's prescription for lifting the weight of worry is a practical performance. Look at verse 9, if you will, please. Um, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, if something must be done to make the worry go, then go do what you should do to get rid of the worry. Someone has said that there's only two things you should never worry about. Don't worry about things you can change. Go change them. 
Don't worry about things that you have no control over because it won't do any good anyways. But if, if, if the worry that you have in your mind, the cause of that worry is something you can do something about it, go do it. it that's a practical performance, you see. But do it according to the Scripture, not according to your own philosophy or something you've read in a book or something you've heard men say. For instance, is there somebody you hate? Somebody you hate. I mean, you just absolutely hate. Now, hate will cause worry. It will create worry in your mind, your heart. Is there somebody you hate? Kill them. <laughs> that isn't what the Bible says. You say, well, I hate somebody. If I can just get rid of them. You know, the Bible says love them and pray for them. That'll get rid of the hate. That'll get rid of the worry. Just love them. And somebody will say, you don't know what they've done to me. It doesn't matter. Love them anyway. What'd they do to Jesus? When they nailed the, when they put the nails in his hand, he loved the men that were doing it. When they smote him across the face and beat him across the back, he loved the men that were doing it. You say, how do you know that? Because when he's hanging on the cross, he looked down at the crowd and looked up to the, the Father in heaven and said, Father, forgive them. You don't forgive somebody you don't love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And Jesus on the cross loved the very men that nailed him to the cross. Somebody you hate, somebody you don't like, somebody you can't stand, pray for them and love them. Practical performance. Fifth and the fifth ingredient in God's prescription is a positive contentment. Look at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now Paul's victory over worry wasn't easy. He didn't say, I just snapped my finger and it was gone. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you tonight if you'll do these six things that all of a sudden you'll never worry again. Because what Paul says here is he learned it. He had to learn it. Something you learn. The learning process sometimes isn't easy. It takes a lot of work. Uh, experience, I believe, is one of the greatest ways to learn. Experiences of life will ultimately teach us <clears throat> there's nowhere to run and hide. You can't run from your problems, you can't hide from your problems. They're there. People try to do that by getting drunk. <clears throat> People try to do that by taking drugs. And they find out when they come out of the high or they come out of the, they come out of the, the alcohol uh, effect, the problem's still there. In fact, the problem is greater. Maybe they had a financial problem. Instead of trying to work on their financial problem, they went out and wasted their paycheck on, on drinking. And now they, they, they had a few moments of relief while their mind was controlled by alcohol and they sober up and now they, they're facing the same problems and additional problems. Drugs same way. Wake up, he's worse off, he wants another high, so he goes out and steals or robs or something else to get another high and another high and another high, but he's never satisfied. Has to be contentment. Has to be learned. It's a process. Paul said, I've learned. Paul went through a lot of things. He went through abuse, wrong accusations, false accusations by brethren even, by his own brethren. He said, he said there were, there were uh, his own brethren that accused him of things that just were not true. I, I, I mentioned Wednesday night. Uh, I gave a copy to, to Brother Kevin. I received um, in the mail, in the newspaper, there's an Episcopalian bishop. Now, that's not just a pastor, but a bishop, a higher, in the hierarchy of the Episcopal Church, who has written a book and has concluded he says intellectually, scientifically, historically, through research, he has concluded that the Apostle Paul was a homosexual. And he's written a book about it. Now, when Paul was here, I don't know if he was ever accused of that or not. I, I suppose there's probably nothing, to me at least, there's nothing worse you can be accused of than that. Now, today in our society, it's... <laughs> I guess it's not that much of an accusation to some, but to me that's probably the worst because that's unnatural. Something that's unnatural is just worse. There are sins that God looks down upon with greater disdain than others. And one of them is 
unnaturalness. There, there is, uh, it says in uh, 1 Timothy 3 about the last days. We're in the last days. In the last days, uh, men should be lovers of themselves, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and without natural affection. You see that every, every young woman that walks into an abortion clinic is without natural affection. I'm sorry to say that, but it's the truth. It, it really is. I mean, I know that a young girl, single, scared, without help, I know sometimes maybe that's not just their only, their only uh, reason for doing it, but basically, uh, you have the fruit of your own womb conceived within your body, and to destroy or kill that fruit is unnatural. There, there should be a natural affection for the fruit of your womb, and yet, you know, they'll leave babies here and abandon babies there and women and men, wives, husbands, just abandoning their children and becoming a burden on society. I mean, child welfare and, and all kinds of support systems, and I'm not against them. God bless them. I mean, we need to take care of the children. But, I mean, it's just it's become su becoming such a great burden on society. I don't know where it's going to take us. I don't think anyone has the answers. But it's because there is unnatural affection. The natural thing... For a mother is to protect her young, to protect them, no matter how many, one or two or five or six or seven, no matter how many she's got, her natural, oh, she'll protect them. And, and the father will provide for them. That's the natural affection. That's gone in these days, just about gone. So we see all of these things. Uh, people are, are not content, discontent, discontent. We need to learn to be content with what we have. My lot in life, I'm not saying it's wrong to try to, to, to try to progress in your job. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, you know, we live in a democratic society. We live in a, we live in a free market system. And, man, if you want to make more money and have the opportunity, I know people are saying, oh, well, you ball player, you play, pay too much money. I'm sure, I'm sure that if you were one of these baseball stars and and, and you went in to sign a contract, and they said, well, look, we want to pay you $3 million next year. And you said, no, 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 100000 will be fine, 100000 uh, No, 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 I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, you can argue all you want, but we live in that kind of a system. And if you can make more money, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with trying to, to better yourself. I mean, there isn't anything God says in his word, it's sinful, unless you love that, unless you crave that, unless you worship that, unless that's the most important thing to you, unless you are discontent with having less. I think sometimes God will give more to his people, will allow them to have more because he, he knows certain ones, it will not hurt them, it will not turn them, it will not change them. Think of, think of oftentimes the things we could not do, humanly speaking, if God had not given money to some, we couldn't carry on a missionary program. There are some people in our church that have the ability to give much more than others, and because of that, we're able to do more. So we're not, we're not talking about that. We're just saying that don't be discontent, though, if you don't have it. Learn to be content with what you have. So Paul was accused by false brethren. Back then, now even today, here, the poor man's been dead and in heaven for 2,000 years. Here they are picking on him today. I, I really think somebody's always coming out and you say, oh, this great musician or that king or, or this actor or somebody else, you know, he's been dead for 50 years. Oh, they were a homosexual. Or, oh, they were this or they were... Who cares? They're dead. Leave them alone. They're dead. Paul, when he was here, he's falsely accused, falsely accused, falsely accused. Well, what are they trying to do now? Leave the man alone. But he said, doesn't make any difference to me. Even by the brethren. They can say what they want, do what they want. It's not going to turn me against God. I've learned to be content where God has put me, doing what God wants me to do. God giving me what I have. I've learned to be content. I say, you know, modern translation of that is simply I've learned how to eat hamburgers or steak. Or, or sleep, in a, sleep in a barn or sleep in a, in a motel. It doesn't make, make any difference where I am, what circumstances I am. I've just learned to be content. When you have that kind of peace with God, see? Now the sixth ingredient, the last one, finally, is in verse 13. I'm done. I can do. I can do. I can do. I can do. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. This verse encourages man, but it exalts Christ. I mean, I take the first part of that verse, you know, 
And that's fine, you know, that's good psychology. And I know guys try to use it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And then I find out I can't do it and I'm discouraged. I read the whole verse, see, it encourages me, but it exalts Christ because I can't do it myself. I can do all things through Christ. So Paul's sufficiency was not of himself. His sufficiency was of Christ. That's the difference. We will be in constant worry if we trust only in our own human ability. How to overcome worry? Take God's prescription. The power of Christ, the power of Christ, see in verse 13, is unlimited. The resource is unlimited. The power of Christ saves us and the power of Christ keeps us. Every time I meet someone who has had the victory, who's really had the victory, they usually say this in these words or some other words that mean the same thing. I had the victory when I really turned it over to Christ. I had the victory when I really turned it over to Christ. Think of in your own life. When did you get saved? You know when I got saved? When I realized that I couldn't do anything to save myself. And I turned it over to Christ. And He saved me. You know when I had real assurance? When I realized I couldn't do anything to keep myself saved. And I turned it over to Christ. So no matter what the problem, or the sin, or the plague, or the worry that you have, what you must do, if you're going to have victory, is take God's prescription. Just turn it over to Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please.